Hello, welcome to Toronto Bible Study. I'm your host, Mike Zampat, and uh, today I want to talk about this video by this guy sniffing out Pharisees. And his his a channel that I actually I liked a lot of his videos over the years or over the past year and a bit since I became free grace because he's a free grace preacher. So I I like people like this, even Truth Speller and other people like that. I learned a lot from them when I first started getting into this thing. But I quickly came to realize that these guys are very basic, like him, like this guy, Truth Speller, whoever else, I don't know. There's a bunch of, there's a, there's a few of them. There's not that many, actually, but a lot of these guys are very basic, you know, and it, which is all right. That's fine. Whatever, you know, you don't have to be so advanced, right? It's like you're just preaching the gospel. That's great. That's amazing, you know? But now I can see that sometimes they <clears throat> they think like, I don't know, man, you know, with, with free grace thing, with the free grace thing, right? When people come to realize this thing and they want to start teaching it, what happens is they find that practically every denomination doesn't teach free grace, right? So then if you're a free gracer, you think oh, all these people are damning people to hell with their false, with their false gospel. And so you get angry at them, and then you think like, well, okay, I guess I'm the only one out here teaching, you know, teaching properly, teaching it properly. So then, then they start to think they got it all figured out, and other and other other denominations that aren't teaching free grace, they're just idiots, you know. And it's true enough that they are pretty foolish for not teaching free grace, those other denominations, but. That doesn't mean that that you know everything just because you figured out a free grace gospel. The gospel is the simple part of the Bible. Okay, it's simple enough for a little kid to understand it. So you got it? Okay, good. Well, that's amazing. That's a wonderful thing. But understand, you just got this thing that's like a little kid can understand it. And that's not what the Bible is. The Bible is not something a little kid can understand. The gospel is, the Bible is this incredibly complex thing that uh, no human being could ever really understand fully. But we try and we, and we come and we, and we learn more and more as we grow in, in the grace and <clears throat> the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, right? So, you know, when you, when you, when you, like, if you want to preach the gospel, you know the gospel now, you want to preach the gospel, you go ahead, man, I, more power to you. But if you want to start teaching other things in the Bible, you better get your acts, like, get it, get your ducks in a row before you start doing that. Don't just think, oh, well, oh, these other free grace people teach it, so I guess it's okay. No, man, do your homework, okay? Because right now, this guy's sniffing out Pharisees. I mean, there's a couple of things he did over over the over the last little while that that were bugging me. So, the one thing he did, one thing he did that bugged me was that he um he like what did he do? He he was like basically saying that those guys, those like those guys from um. The new international, what are they called? The new independent fundamentalist Baptist. That's like the new IFB they're called, right? Now, these are guys that they're like under Stephen Anderson. And they preach this false gospel where if a person is gay or, or like, or whatever, they have homosexual desires or whatever, they can't be saved. That's what they teach. And this guy, he still uh, he still pumps their videos on his channel. And I told him that. I told him, like, hey, man, these guys are heretics teaching this false gospel where gay people can't be saved or whatever. And then he just still leaves their stuff up on his channel. So right there, you know, he just doesn't really care that much about the truth. He just thinks he knows everything. And then now he's got this video. He's got it's called Dead to the Law. And I know a lot of these guys, they teach this thing where, okay, 
these free gracers, right? Who who don't know anything, like like uh, destroying the works of the devil, truth speller, uh, David Greg or what is it? Greg Jackson, David Benjamin, and these people. They teach this thing where <clears throat> you're dead to the law now, right? Since you've been saved, so therefore, like. Your whole life now is is not nothing to do with the law, and it's all about just Christ living through Christ, and and that's how you can avoid sin and stuff like that. And so, but they don't really. It's like it's very. I don't know. It's very vague. Anyway, listen to what they say. Let's just listen to these guys. It's, it's kind of ridiculous, but whatever. Finally, my brethren. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. So I'm going to quickly go over the main points I have on why we as believers, free grace believers, should not be living according to the law, in an attempt to supposedly please God. I mean, I don't understand why you would think that filthy rag law adherence which is non-existent is just law breaking i don't understand why anyone would believe their law breaking means anything at all to an impeccable holy of holies god your law adherence went out the window the moment you sinned now it's all just law breaking our law breaking is an abomination it's laughable it's putrid it's filthy menstrual soiled rags that's all it is that's all it ever will be until the day we drop dead. This offends the filthy self-righteous dogs in our world, the filthy hell-bound circumcision. We should be dead to the law. Go ahead and call me an antinomian, as if everyone isn't an antinomian. If you sin... No, everyone is not an antinomian sniffing out Pharisees. and You are an antinomian because of what you're saying here. What you're saying is antinomian. And it's like you don't understand. You don't understand that we do still have a relationship to the law, obviously. Okay? Every time you don't sin, you're obeying the law. So, I'm pretty sure he's not telling people that they should go and sin. So, why would you say that we don't have any relationship to the law? We're trying to not sin, right? That's something we're trying to do as Christians. Or we're not trying, we're like, we're trying to avoid sinning, obviously. So that's, that's following the law, you know? So these people don't understand. Like, they don't understand. There's, it's much more complicated, Paul's letters especially, but the whole Bible is much more complicated than people think. So once, well, sometimes people figure out this, you figure out this thing, free grace, you figure that out, you're like, oh, okay, now I have the key to the whole Bible. And you kind of do, that kind of is the key to the whole Bible. But you're not just going to, just because you have the key doesn't mean you're going to open all the locks. That takes a long time to open all the locks. You got to study. You got to really take your time and, and research this thing. But these guys think they all have it all figured out, but they don't. And you're against the law. That makes you an antinomian. And an antinomian. If you sin, you're against the law. That makes you an antinomian. If, if you sin, you're an antinomian. No. If you sin... That doesn't mean you're against the law. That just means that you broke the law. But you could be in support of the law and still sin, obviously. Right? So that's all that means. It doesn't mean you're an antinomian. Antinomian means you're against the law. You don't you think there should be no law or something. But if you think that, that's not Christian. Anyway, going over the main points of the video now on why we should be dead to the law. Point number one, if you're not dead to the law, you risk having babes in Christ or the unsaved follow it for salvation. Point number two. It's like, what, what does dead to the law even mean, right? I mean, Paul uses that phrase in Romans 7. What he's talking about is how they're dead to the law for salvation. And this guy, this guy brings it up here a little bit. Uh, he just kind of gives it as if that's stupid or something, but he's talking about, that's what he is talking about. You know, he's saying, he's saying they're dead to the law in that sense. You know, you're no longer part of it 
for those things. But obviously the law is still a good thing that we should, we don't follow, we don't obey it like we're under it, right? But it's obviously teaching us about how to be good people. Don't commit adultery, okay? If you don't commit adultery, then you're following the law. Hello, okay? So I don't know what these guys are even talking about. And then they'll go, oh, you don't follow the law to avoid sin. You just you just renew your mind in Christ. What? What are you talking about? It's just a bunch of nonsense. Like, I don't know. Like, but Because the, I think this guy got caught up with those guys, David Benjamin and, and uh, Greg Jackson. Now, I don't know too much about Greg Jackson. Or I don't know even less about David Benjamin. But the two of them, they seem like false teachers to me. You know, and, and sniffing out Pharisees, he seems to be just somebody who's kind of confused. He doesn't get it. You know, but let's see. Maybe I maybe I don't get it. So if I, if I if I don't get it, please put the comments or make a video about me or something sniffing out Pharisees or whatever you want to do. Let me know if I'm wrong. Let me know. But I'm going to show you why you're wrong. Two, if you're not dead to the law, you risk buddy budding with damnable mm -hmm. heretics. Number three, the law is a subtle distraction to not talk about Jesus. Number four, the law makes you sin conscious ironically leading to more sin and then after i go over these main points i'm going to go over some passages in the bible that people take out of context to say that the law is how we should live the christian life then i'm going to give a better alternative on how we should live as christians which is the same way we got saved the gospel it's all about looking to jesus in the life of a christian for salvation and after salvation the gospel is not just for justification, it's also for sanctification. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. Yeah, this thing, this thing is about salvation. This, this verse here, where he's talking, Jesus is our sanctification, that's about salvation. That's what that refers to, like Hebrews 10, um, verse 10, 12, and 14, where he talks about how Christ has sanctified us forever, made us perfect. By one perfect sacrifice, he's sanctified us for, for all, for all time or something. Like, that's what that's about. But there's another kind of sanctification. First Corinthians, First Thessalonians chapter 4, which is up to us. That's part of us, avoiding fornication and things like that. But well, I guess maybe we could talk about that as the video goes on. And also a uh, shout out to David Benjamin <laughs> and this video. On that, you know, so I, I taught Christ is our righteousness in the whole grace community. They liked me then because I was teaching justification by faith and eternal security. But then... As I started to distinguish and teach the next part of what I'm supposed to teach, which is Christ is our sanctification, he's not only our righteousness, but he's also our sanctification, that started producing division. Uh, because it's contrary to what most people think. Most people believe that sanctification is a matter of commandment keeping. So that's what I teach about sanctification, is Christ is our sanctification. There is no real sanctification without Christ manifested to me. And for those who have learned to enjoy him, they're experiencing breakthrough and rest, not only from the sense of debt to God, but also they're getting delivered from long-term long patterns of besetting sin that the devil had convinced them that they were slaves to you know, the gospel sets people free. That's what John Bunyan said. The law tells me to fly, but the gospel gives me wings. Yeah, like the gospel sets you free from the dominion of sin, right? Like sin has no, sin hath no more dominion over you. It can't, it doesn't control you the way it did before you were saved, okay? But that doesn't mean that now you're just, now all you have to do is just, Think about the gospel all the time, and then you won't sin. Like, let me show you this one. Um, First Thessalonians chapter 4. Okay. Uh, let me 
let's see. I hope you guys can read this. I don't know. Okay. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk, how ye ought to walk, and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. So he's telling them how to walk, how to live. Walk, it means like how your, your daily life, your manner of living. Okay, that's what he's saying. Um, how, how to please God. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, but even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go back and be def beyond go beyond and defy his brother in any matter. This is so he's just telling them to live like to not sin, right? And he's saying that that is their sanctification. He's telling them to not sin because that is their sanctification. And obviously, this is following the law. Obviously, right? I mean, anytime you don't sin, you're obeying the law. Sin is transgression of the law. What First John three four. So then. If you're if you're saying as a Christian that you're not going to sin, then you're obeying the law. Okay, so you're not you're dead, dead to the law doesn't mean you don't have any relationship to the law. As I told, uh, what's his name, uh, destroying the works of the devil, but whatever. Anyway, if you support my channel, you're gonna you're gonna support him. But uh, his whole ministry is basically based on how we should live as Christians which is the gospel it's jesus not according to law i highly recommend see the, see the thing like okay how we should live as christians is the gospel and jesus like they're so simplistic and it's just like just live the gospel guys just keep and you know what he says oh anyway listen to them but it's just like ridiculous okay they don't have how can you possibly have like an ethic as a christian if all you do is just live the gospel what does that mean what does that even mean? It doesn't mean anything. So we have we we should try to. It's not that we're under the law, but the law is like a thing that tells us how to live. And I'm talking about the moral laws, like not the ceremonial laws. Okay, so we're talking about the the laws like don't yeah don't commit adultery. We're not talking about laws like keeping the Sabbath or not eating pork. Okay, and these are distinguished in the Bible. Okay, so I don't like just because I'm saying follow the law, I'm not saying you have to wear tassels on your shirt like young Don. Okay, I'm just saying you you shouldn't commit adultery, you shouldn't commit fornication. We understand that as Christians, okay? And if you understand that and you're trying to live that way, you are following the law. That's what that is. If you try, if you say, I'm going to love my neighbor as a Christian, well, that's following the law. So I don't know why you guys are talking like this. I, I really don't understand it. I think they're just confused. Well, this guy, David Benjamin, and his buddy, Greg Jackson, I'm a little bit suspicious of these guys as maybe shills. But, that, but stiffing out Ferris, he seems like he's just confused. Recommend him. He makes videos and even has a website where he gives his ebooks free of charge or name your price. His channel and website will be in the video description. So dead to the law. I get this from a passage in Romans and Galatians. Romans chapter 7 starting verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no more adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another. So in other words, if you look to the law to supposedly grow spiritually, you are an adulterer. 
Well, no, that's only if you're following the law for salvation. Okay. Perhaps you're not married to the law, but you're still flirting with the law. Even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto, unto God. You have to be dead to the law to bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in yeah, the... Yeah, again, yeah, that is, the, that is about salvation, though. It's dead to the law. You're dead to the law, now you're reborn in Christ. That's how you can bring fruit, bring forth fruit and stuff, right? But it's not because he's saying that the law is just something you're going to completely ignore and never look at. Um, let me just show you something else here. Sorry. Um, so it's Romans 7. Okay, this is the section he was reading. Uh, so because he's saying like, look, you're you're bound to the law. Um, you were bound to the law, right? And now you're now you're not. You're now you're married to now the church is married to Christ. So we're no longer bound to the law. You also become dead to the law by the body of Christ. This is just a metaphor for him to make them understand that we're no longer bound by the law as Christians. We're no longer under the law. You know, that's what he's talking about here. So. Uh, anyway, so I wanted to show you at the end of the chapter here what he says. Look what he says here. Look what he says. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. I delight in the law of God. I delight. Okay, his inward man, his in inside his spirit and his soul, they delight in the law. It's his flesh that can't deal with it, okay? Um the law of sin. See the law it's like the the another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. That's the law in his in his mind he's following the law of God. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. The sin in his members of his body is the law of sin. And look at this. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. With my mind, I serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. He's talking about how we're weak in the flesh to obey the law. And that's why we needed Christ to save us, right? Because we can't follow the law. We can't follow it perfectly. All right? So then, but then he still serves the law of God with his mind. Because we should try to follow the law. It's just understood, understanding now that, look, you can't follow it perfectly. So that's why you have Christ. Christ has made you righteous. Even when you sin, even when you break the law, you're still going to be okay. You're still going to heaven. That's what that is. That's what salvation is. And then, but then we still follow the law. We still, of course, we, we don't steal. We don't commit fornication. We don't commit adultery. That's following the law. Okay. So we don't just say, oh, we're dead to the law. Just do whatever you want. And he's, and he's going to say, oh, no, that's not how, that's not how we, uh, we do it. If we, if we, if we just, renew our mind in Christ every day, then we'll avoid sin naturally. Well, no, that's not what he's talking about, man. That's just, that's not at all what he's talking about. But the thing is, yeah, this is what happens. Like, because laws, Paul's laws, Paul's letters, and, and the whole Bible, but Paul's letters especially are very difficult, okay? And so people, they, they try to figure it out, they get tired eventually, and then they say, oh, well, it's just, this must be it. You know, and they don't read, like, look, can't you just read to the end of the chapter, sniffing out Pharisees? Then you know that he says that he follows the law with his mind. And you wouldn't continue to talk this stuff, what you're saying, you know? The flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. That's all the law produces, death. See what he says? See what he said there? He says the law produces death. That's not what that says. That's not what that says. When we were in the flesh, 
the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. The motions of sins are what bring forth fruit unto death, not the law. The law is perfect, holy, and good. Okay? Don't listen to people. Like this. Like I say, this man is just very confused. I like this guy, you know, but he's very confused. And it's like, it's very tempting, you know, when, and I've done, I've, I've fallen to this temptation too. When you're very sure about what you're saying in the Bible and teaching it, and then you get mad at people that are teaching other things because you think that they're just wicked heretics. And so it's easy to get into that kind of mentality where you're just yelling at people who disagree with you. And you're just like acting like you're so righteous because you got it all figured out. But this is this person does not understand, okay? And again, look, sniffing out Pharisees, if I'm wrong, right? Just put a comment or make a video or whatever you want to do. But explain to me why Paul says that at the end of this chapter. Why he says he follows the law with his mind. And 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 that kind of thing. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve by following the law. That's not what it says. That we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the old. He's saying serve the law. <laughs> serve, serve the law in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. So you st he's still saying to serve the law, but it's just not in the letter. This It's the law of the spirit. It's the law of love, like the law that love every everything all the law comes under these two laws love love god and love thy neighbor as thyself that's what he's talking about he's not saying you don't follow the letter of the law well i mean the letter of the law says don't steal right so we know that as christians we shouldn't steal so that's following the letter of the law okay but he's not saying that he's just saying I mean, there might be some point where you, you do have to steal for love, right? Like you have to steal some bread to feed your starving kid. Well, that would be f serving, in the new, serving in the newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Because you're still serving the law. You're serving love, which is part of the law, right? But you're just holding that above the law of not stealing. And that's something you did through the spirit because you know what's important here. But and also because Jesus said this, said that that all the law falls under love, and so and so you're not going to follow the letter of the law. You're going to follow the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law says love is higher than don't, don't not stealing. So you steal the bread to feed your kid. But it's not like you just think, like I don't know what these guys are exactly saying. They don't know either. They're very confused, right? Because he's not saying that we should just go out and sin. He's not saying that. He's not saying just throw the law in the garbage, right? But he is kind of saying you're supposed to be dead to the law and just live by faith in Christ. Well, living by faith in Christ doesn't tell me how to live, okay? And if you think that, oh, you can just let Christ take control of your life, which is what he suggests later, that's just foolishness. That's just another form of that progressive sanctification doctrine, which is another false doctrine. Holdness of the letter, a.k.a. the law. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me so basically to sum it all to sum all that up you must be dead to the law to grow spiritually all the that's what he that's what he he thinks he thinks that what paul just said there what he just read is summed up in this thing that he's teaching about oh you must be dead to the law to grow spiritually what in paul's what what in that what paul just said Makes you think that you have to be dead to the law to grow spiritually. He's talking about before he was a Christian, how it was, right? How how the the law was in his life and stuff, right? 
And then he talks about something else. Like, it's not about saying, he's not, he's certainly not saying that in order to grow spiritually, we have to be dead to the law or whatever dead to the law means. Like, in, 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 the, in the mind of sniffing out Pharisees, I don't know what dead to the law means to this guy because it's very confusing what he's saying, but it doesn't mean, like, if he's trying to say that I shouldn't have that thing in my mind, don't commit adultery and then not do that thing because because it's against the law. If that's what he's trying to say, like, I, I can't do that. I shouldn't do that as a Christian. Well, that's foolishness, okay? And if he thinks that uh, I can just, you know, pray to God, let Jesus control my life, that's just foolishness too. That's not that's not what the Bible's telling you to do, okay? That up. You must be dead to the law to grow spiritually. All the law produces is sin and death. All the law produces is sin and death. Well, that's not, again, that's not what that those passages said, okay? It was that sin, sin was working through, because the law, like, made sin so apparent, you know? And then it, it's like kind of like when you tell somebody you can't do that, then they just want to do it. That's what the law did to the to the Hebrews and Paul. That's what he's talking about there. The law tells me I shouldn't covet my neighbor's wife, and before that he didn't even care. But then as soon as the, as soon as he got the law in his head, now he wants his neighbor's wife. Okay, that's what he's saying. He's not saying that that the law is all the law does is creates death and and misery. That's not what he's saying. The law is perfect good and righteous that's what paul says about the law okay anyway because you have to keep it perfectly at all times 24 7 as james 2 and as galatians chapter 3 verse yeah again this is this is when james says this and galatians they're talking about keeping the law for salvation if you want to keep the law for salvation just like jesus said to the rich man right you want to go to heaven? You want to inherit? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Oh, keep the law. Keep the keep the commandments. So then you have to, yeah, keep it perfectly, every single one, if you want to make it into heaven based on your law, your law obedience, okay? But now we know we're not making it to heaven on our law obedience. We're making it to heaven on faith in Christ, okay? So that's what we do. But now how are we going to live our life as Christians? Well, it's basically by following, <laughs> by obeying the law. I mean, not again, not those ceremonial laws. But when, when the law says, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. And we obviously know as Christians that we shouldn't do those things. Well, we're, we're following the law. We're, we're obeying the law. Okay? 10 says, you have to believe the Bible when it says you are dead to the law. This is the only way to... Again, they're just taking that thing out of context. That thing is a metaphor. He's using a metaphor to describe the relational change that has occurred since Christ came, or since we were saved. Now you're saved. Now you're dead to the law. Okay? It's a metaphor. He's not trying to say that you have no relationship to the law, and the law is just stupid, and the law only produces sin and death. That's not what he's saying. God, anyway, whatever. To grow spiritually. Galatians chapter 2, starting verse 19. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am... Again, this is... They take this out of context. This thing, in Galatians, he's talking about how the church, the Galatian church, they started thinking that they had to follow the law for, like, as if it's like they have to. As if, like, they have to get get circumcised and you know whatever else things that they were doing who knows right but they're there it's clearly like what he's writing them about is that they thought they had to follow the law okay for salvation probably and also probably for like their their life you know their christian life oh get circumcised or you're a sinner you're not a real christian or something you know so that's why he's writing these things that's why he's saying these things but it's not saying that that's how you live your life as a Christian. Just you're dead to the law and the law is no, is no use to you whatsoever. The law is very useful to you. It's very useful to us to learn how to live. Okay. And we should study the law. And we should like the law is good. The law is perfect, good, and righteous. It's perfect. 
okay? So I don't know why these guys are acting like it's some bad thing. Oh, all it produces is sin and death. No, that's not what it said. That's not what he was saying there. Anyway. Crucified with Christ, and nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Yeah, this is just talking about salvation. Okay, now you're crucified with Christ. You live now, but your Christ is the one that gave your life, so live in him. Okay, it's not talking about that, that Christ is going to control your life or anything, like what he says later. If you're still looking to the law for spiritual growth, what you are saying is you're not dead. And if you believe you're not dead, Jesus can't live your life for you. You take control of your life, not Jesus. I'd rather learn how to have Jesus control me and not myself control. Yeah, like you see, like he's trying to say that Jesus is going to control you. How does that, what, where does the Bible say that? That Jesus is going to control me? If I just, what, what I have to do to do that? And then, then I don't have to worry about sinning because Jesus is going to control me. Is that what this person is saying? I don't know. This is just ridiculous. All my life with my supposed law adherence. Again, I highly recommend David Benjamin and his crew. Ninety-nine. Nah, nah. These guys are weirdos. Don't li don't listen to these people, man. Okay, I don't know why this guy's recommending these people. Like even him, like he's kind of he's kind of dangerous too. Because like I say, he teaches he he pushes that uh, new IFB garbage. So this guy's kind of although I do like him or I like his like he I've I appreciate the things I learned from him or whatever, but. He's, he's, this is, person is teaching dangerous things, okay? And this guy, David Benjamin, he teaches some dangerous things too. I'm going to investigate this guy more closely. 0.9999% of churches are not preaching Jesus as your sanctification. They're saying the law. Yeah, Jesus is not, Jesus is our sanctification for going to heaven, okay? But then there's another sanctification, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, at the beginning there, first three or four verses. Read it. Learn it. How you live is how you get sanctified. That's how you grow. That's you, not Jesus. If you're going to. Wow. These guys are just like, they don't get it, man. They don't get this thing. Okay. It's like, yeah, Jesus saved you. Okay. He's the savior. He's not going to live your life for you. Okay. Wow, man. I'd be talking about sanctification, growing spiritually, and Jesus is barely mentioned. That's not sanctification. Why don't, why don't these guys like just do a word search on sanctification? Just look up how many times does sanctification appear in the New Testament and look at all those passages and try to figure out what it means. At least one of those passages is going to be 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And you're going to see that right there, it doesn't mean this. It doesn't mean Jesus sanctified you and you're done. That's for salvation. Yes, Jesus did sanctify us and we're done for salvation. But your life now as a Christian, that's you got to sanctify that yourself. Yeah, that's you do that by avoiding fornication and avoiding other sins. That's what it literally says. First Thessalonians chapter four. The law doesn't quicken your spirit. So how can law breaking be how you grow spiritually? Make how can law breaking because these what he's saying when he says law breaking he means like following the law is impossible so it's all law breaking that's what he's trying to say he's trying to be clever like that so i guess what he's saying is how can wait let me see what he's saying jesus is barely mentioned that's not sanctification the law doesn't quicken your spirit so how can law breaking be how you grow spiritually the law doesn't quicken your spirit, so how can law obedience be how you grow spiritually? The law doesn't quicken. Yeah, the law. Yeah, I, again, this is the thing. Jesus quickened our spirits, so now we're alive in Christ. Now we have to live our life, right? So how do we do that? How do we do that? How do I decide whether I should sleep around on my wife or not? Well, I think I shouldn't because the law says thou shalt not commit adultery. What well, that seems like a pretty logical thing to think, all right? And then when I read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I see more about that. And there's many other warnings about that. And even in this chapter uh Romans 
chapter 7 he's telling them not to get into not to do sins anyway anyway whatever this is understand makes no sense you're no better than a hellbound buddhist monk every false religion preaches god's law cuz it's already in their heart only free grace believers have the power to overcome sin which is the gospel yeah, the power to come, overcome sin is the gospel, yeah. The gospel is the power of God to, uh, to salvation, uh, to salvation to everyone that believeth. And salvation from, yeah, slavery to sin is also part of that. Salvation from death, salvation from slavery to sin, that's true, okay? Now, what do you say? Only free grace believers have the power to overcome sin, which is the gospel. Yeah, but then, okay, so now we got the gospel, we're saved now, and now we have no, sin has no more dominion over us, okay? So now we can, we have the power to overcome sin, or to not, like, commit sins, if we, if we are able to, you know, if we walk in the spirit and not in the flesh, if we resist the Resist the devil, he will flee from us, okay? That's because we have the spirit. But like when we when we resist the devil, what are we doing? We're resisting the devil because he wants us to break the law. He wants us to commit fornication. He wants us to commit adultery or commit murder. So then when we when we resist that urge, we're doing it to keep the law. Okay? So I don't know, like these guys just don't understand anything, man. Preach the gospel to yourself. That's how you Look got saved. So this lot... is what these guys. This is what these guys do. There, there's. He's literally saying right now that if you preach the gospel to yourself, that that will allow you to over uh, to never sin anymore. That that's all you have to do. You don't have to like try to like literally not commit the sin. You just have to keep preaching the gospel to yourself. And it's just gonna renew your mind or whatever. Romans twelve. And then you're not. And then you're gonna be. You're not going to commit sin anymore. Which is the gospel. Preach the gospel to yourself. That's how you got saved. So logically, that's how you grow spiritually. Oh, oh, preach the gospel to yourself. That's how you got saved. So logically, that's how you that's how you grow spiritually. What? What are you talking about? What does the Bible say to preach the gospel to yourself? Where does it say that in the Bible? Does it does, does Paul go around teaching the gospel to himself? I don't know, man. These guys are like it's weird. Setting your mind on things above, renewing your mind day by day. So finally, going over my main points. Setting your mind on things above. The, yes, that's what we should do. That's what it says. Does that mean we should preach the gospel to ourselves? Is that what are those two things the same thing? No. No, not at all. Okay, so I don't know, it's just nonsense. Point number one, if you're not dead to the law, you risk having babes or the unsaved follow it for salvation. Now I've noticed this. If you talk about law, everyone calls you a work salvationist, even though you're not preaching a works-based salvation. If you talk about grace, now everyone believes you're saying to just live like the devil, go out and fornicate, do drugs, whatever. Most people do not rightly divide. Second Timothy chapter two verse fifteen: Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now everybody thinks they know what this means. <laughs> everybody thinks that they figured out how to rightly divide, and then and other people don't. But be careful to just assume that you know what this means. Okay, be very careful. First Peter chapter three verse sixteen, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So either way, you're gonna be falsely accused. At what? You'd rather be falsely accused of preaching a license to sin, rather than be falsely accused of preaching a works-based salvation. And have so okay so. He's saying that if you're not dead to the law, I don't know what dead to the law means still. He still hasn't established that or explained that, right? But let's just say he's saying if you're not dead to the law, you risk. So I guess he's saying that if we talk anything about the law, 
if we say anything about about how the law has any relationship to us that then we're risking teaching people that they can be saved by the law what if what if our whole teaching is just is just no you cannot be saved by obeying the law which is correct but after you're saved the law is a good guide for you in how to live your life what's wrong with that there's nothing wrong with that nothing okay and again i'm not talking about the ceremonial laws but even those ceremonial laws there's lots of christians and lots of like you know people who who think i don't follow those ceremonial laws such as like the the high holy days and things like that i don't follow them for salvation but i like them and i just want to follow them because i think that they're godly and there's nothing wrong with that there's absolutely nothing wrong with that if that's what they want to do romans 14 okay have people follow the law for their salvation because of me you can't go wrong with just preaching free grace i'm gonna be dead to free grace where does where does was does free grace mean no more law at all after you're saved that it's just that the law has no no relationship to us whatsoever is that what free grace means because i thought free grace meant that you believe the gospel and you're saved and you can't lose it and there's no works to to get to to get salvation that's free grace to me just faith alone and you can't lose your salvation that's what free grace is it's got nothing to do with all this stuff that he's saying that you're dead to the law and no and you just all you do is just keep preaching the gospel to yourself and that's how you can live as a good christian what to the law the only time i'm going to be i'm going to talk about laws is when talking about salvation how the law condemns you to hell that's the only time i'm going to be talking about law that's all the law is good for. So second point, if you're not dead to the law, you risk buddy-budding with damnable heretics. <laughs> Similar to point one, since most people don't rightly divide, if you preach law, work salvationists will think you're on their side. They will creep in unawares to try and have fellowship with you, deceiving you more and more until you become a full-blown apostate. Tut yeah, I don't, I don't know why this would happen. I mean, I'm just saying that, uh, okay, yeah, you're not saved by any works of the law, okay? You're saved by faith alone in Christ's promise and in the gospel. You believe that, you're saved, you're going to heaven, okay? And now that you're saved and you're going to heaven, the law is a good guide for your life, not the ceremonial laws, just the moral laws, it's a good guide for your life. You can't keep it perfectly. That's why you had Jesus. You, we know that. But you can use it as a guide for your life. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Okay? That's, that's what that is. That's what it's for. Okay? And so the idea that... The idea that just preaching that is going to allow these works heretics to come into my thing and, and start making me teach that no that's ridiculous i know the difference between works heretics works salvation heretics and the idea of doing good works after you're saved doing good works after you're saved is good okay james 2 clearly that's what he's saying there for free gracers understand that right i hope that james is saying in in james chapter 2 what he's saying there is not that you need works when he says faith without works is dead, he's not saying that we need to do works or our faith is not sal salvational or we're not saved. He's just saying that faith, like do works, he's saying do works like for the faith, you know, or do work, like he's saying like do works now that you're saved. Yeah, like for the like for the religion, that's part of your religion. That's part of what we do to be profitable, you know? Anyway. That is chapter 1, starting verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially sinners, especially the secular world, especially false religions. That's not what it says. Especially they of the circumcision, the false Christianity, 
the works-based salvation Christianity. That's that's who you got to watch out for. Whose mouths must be stopped. Who subvert whole houses, teaching things that which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. Galatians chapter 2, starting verse 3. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. All these things, all these things are against work salvation preaching. Work salvation. Okay, but works is part of your discipleship. If you're going to be a disciple of Christ, you're going to be a follower of him. This is after you're saved, right? Salvation is not by following him, not by works. Salvation is by faith alone. You believe the gospel, you're saved. Now you're saved. You're not going to hell. You know this. You have life in Christ. You have eternal life, okay? What are you going to do now? What are you going to do? Well, the best thing you could do is be a disciple of Christ. And how do you do that? Well, you do that by doing good works, okay? That's how you do it, all right? And that's called works of the law. Yes, they are part of the law, okay? Good works are part of the law. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Don't listen to a works-based salvationist or else the gospel will cease. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. We know that, man. I mean, this is just, look, Galatians, again, he's just talking about salvation. That was the thing. That's the issue here. These people are teaching that they need to follow the law of Moses for salvation. Or that, or, or maybe that they were saved and then they're saying you have to follow it for, like, it's a sin if you don't follow these ceremonial laws, like circumcision and stuff. But whatever it was, I mean, it seems to be more, mostly focused on the whole work salvation thing, but there seems to be both of those elements there. But either way, it's not saying that following the law is bad after you're saved. It's not saying that. It's just saying that you, like, it's not part of your salvation. Just understand that, okay? The only time I listen to a works salvationist is when I'm exposing them. I stay away from them as much as possible. Whatever a works salvationist has to say, it goes in one ear and out the other. Works salvationists are dead to me. I don't want to hear them. I don't want to know what they have to say about the Bible. False brethren look somewhat. They look nice. Whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want she to take Galatians chapter so, 5, starting verse look, 6. I mean, they're just, he's just talking about how he doesn't listen to those For in Jesus Christ, people. neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Again, this is just against, well. this is all against works-based salvation. All this stuff, this whole letter, this whole letter is, is about works-based salvation. It's not about... Like this idea that you that you shouldn't follow the Who law. Who did hinder you? A little. And again, like when I say follow the law after we're saved, I'm not talking about like in Remnant Two. I'm not talking about like following all those ceremonial laws. I'm just saying that there's obviously certain laws that you have to follow. Not have to, but you should as to to be a good disciple of Christ. And to be a good disciple of Christ, you should follow those laws. Don't sin. Don't commit adultery obviously is a partaker of their evil deeds we see this in in second john chapter one starting verse nine whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of christ hath not god what's the doctrine of christ it's the death burial and resurrection by faith alone no works no repenting of sins no no that's the doctrine of christ the doctrine of Christ is the gospel. Is that what he's saying? Hmm. Maybe. I don't think so. I think I think John's talking about people living good lives as Christians. Good good lives with where they where they don't sin. <laughs> and they try to avoid sinning and stuff. Abiding in Christ, abiding in the doctrine of Christ is not sinning, you know? Or trying to, anyway. Of course, we always sin every day, but it's like living with that integrity, you know? In the same way the Jews never thought that they had to live perfect lives. They understood that it was like, okay, we're going to mess up, but then we sacrifice and, and we go back and we 
do those things and then we're, we're we're okay that's how you maintain your integrity and live perfect as 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 they would say it's not perfect like you're not sinning it's perfect like you you always maintain your integrity when you sin you go and and do the sacrifice when you um or you or you pray for forgiveness you ask god to forgive you you know those kind of things right that's what they that's what they understood and that's what we understand as christians first john chapter one when they if they say you have no sin if they say if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves but if we if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness no law adherence nothing he that abideth in the doctrine of christ he hath both the father and the son if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine receive him not into your house neither bid him godspeed for he that biddeth him godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds I mean, I don't, I don't think that's what John is talking about here. The doctrine of Christ. This is Second John, right? This is not the First John. Sorry, so I'm a little bit confused there. But yeah, in this one, he's talking about they were preaching some kind of false gospel. These guys, and he's just saying that, but he's not saying that that's how we are supposed to live our life or as Christians or anything. Those who support damnable heretics are partake as a subtle distraction to not talk about Jesus. If you speak more about the law and not about Jesus, you're already doing a disservice. No Jesus in the conversation means no salvation and no spiritual growth. Yeah, well, I mean, when I tell people not to sin or, or not to do those things, it's usually, yeah, it's because God, like Jesus is the one who gave us the, this idea. Jesus never disobeyed the law, not even once. And then and if you look at, if you look at like, actually look at that one in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He's always talking about Christ. They received the commandment from Christ. And so all this stuff that he's saying, like don't commit fornication and those things, that's from Christ. The law is from Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. If I want to... What, what was he talking about there, 1 Corinthians 2, 2? What was, what was he actually talking about? Um, he's not saying that, that you shouldn't talk about the law, you should only talk about Jesus. He's just saying that like that's what he was declaring it to them. Christ crucified that was that's he's just saying that he's telling them that that's the important thing here you know the gospel right like anyway I wanted to learn how to better my life I would have gone to some other false religion or some secular club I don't want to better my life I want Jesus to live through me in turn living a better life it's not me though I'm dead so point number four the law yeah, like that thing, like Jesus, yeah, Jesus lives through you. It's it's not like it's not like you just have to like let him control you. He's just saying that he he's saying to let let Jesus live through you by living a good a good life as a good disciple by sticking with like a moral life, which is following the law. I'm sorry. Like, you know, I don't know, like I feel bad like saying this because people will get confused maybe, but it's not following the law for salvation and you don't have to follow the law of those ceremonial laws okay but certain laws yeah if you don't follow them you just committed a sin if you go and commit the law against adultery if you if you don't obey that law then you sinned if you don't obey the law to not steal then you you sin that's obviously true Law makes you sin conscious, ironically leading to more sin. Romans chapter 7 verse 8. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. Now, what is concupiscence? Concupiscence means strong sexual desire or lust. In this context, Paul is not talking about anything sexual. He's just talking about a strong desire. What Paul is basically saying is that the law makes the sin in him want to sin. Romans chapter. Yeah, but that was he's talking about like 
He's talking about before he was saved. You know? Sin taking a ca taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of so concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. Now he's talking about before there was any law, there was like sin. They didn't have that understanding of sin, so it wasn't that uh, a living thing in their life. When the law came, then sin was brought to life because now we know. It's again like I say, when the people tell you not to do something, then you want to do it. The seven verse thirteen. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. See, when he says, when was then that which is good made death unto me? Because the, what he's saying, that which is good, that's the law. He's saying the law is good. He thinks the law is good. Okay, like this, the, he's not saying the law causes death. He's saying sin causes death, but the law brings sin to life. And it's not that, and God obviously knew that that was going to happen, but he, he has a plan here, okay? But what, all he's saying is that, that sin becomes this, this real living force in your life because you know the law. You know you shouldn't do that. When there is a commandment, you will sin. Here's a real life example. I remember in church, this was years ago. I was probably around 13 or so. I remember I went to church with two of my friends. We were just waiting. We were just uh, standing there waiting for my parents. And uh, I looked to the church wall and remembered how there was these panels that when you touch them, it made your skin all tight. It was a very uncomfortable feeling. It felt like little needles on your skin. At the time, I didn't know that it was actually fiberglass. And if you know anything about fiberglass, it's nasty stuff. So I had the bright idea of telling my friends, commanding my friends to not go and touch those panels over there. And guess what they did? They scoffed and went running towards the panels. Not only did they touch the panels, they rolled their body all up against the panels. Of course, they quickly realized their mistake and started freaking out. They started blaming me. And I was like, hey, I, I, I told you guys to not touch those things. I was being a smarty about it. I knew they would go and touch it. That's the same premise with the law. Let's read the passage again. Romans chapter seven, starting verse yeah, eight. Again, that's like, I mean, he's talking about why, like he's talking about a whole historical thing, like why the law was necessary and how it kind of works with our salvation and how everything happened. He's not telling them that, like, if you even think about the law, you're just going to be so focused on sin and you won't be able to do anything. Everybody knows the law now. The law is out. It's out now. So that, that effect of the law, the idea that you want to commit sin because someone told you not to, that effect is still in effect because we're we are still being told don't commit sin don't commit adultery don't commit theft right but sin taking occasion by the commandment right the difference now is that we have Christ's spirit in us so now we can resist now we have the sin doesn't have the dominion over us anymore that it used to okay that's all it is in me all manner of concupiscence so once I commanded my friends to not go touch those things, the the panels, the fiber, the fiberglass panels, the sin inside them wanted to go against my commandment. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. My friends were fine without my commandment. But when I told them not to touch it, sin revived and they went and touched it. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. When, you, when you're going by the law, the sin inside you wants to go against the law. This is why you must be dead to the law and look to Jesus instead. I mean, even in the Garden yeah, of Eden, I think I before just, the did fall. I, show you, I think I showed you guys, right, uh, Romans 7. If you look at Romans 7... 22 it's a delight in the law he delights in the law 
And then Romans 7.25, the very end of this chapter, he says, he serves the law of God with his mind. And then, but the foot is flesh, the law of sin. God commanded them to not eat of the tree. And what did they do? They ate of the tree. Granted, if Satan wasn't there, I don't believe they would have ever ate of the tree because they weren't fallen. But today we're fallen. We have sin inside. The difference here, though, too, is that, you know, Adam and Eve and even the even those Hebrews before, they thought that if they sinned, that if they disobeyed the law, they would die. Right. And even Adam, like Adam and Eve, they were told, if you if you break this commandment, you will die. But we're, we're told because we're saved now through Christ. Right. We're told that even if you break the commandments, you will not die. You will never die. That's what Jesus said. Right. You will never die. So now the law doesn't have this power over us. That's the point here, you know? The law doesn't have that dominion over us to kill us. The law was the death for them, for the unbelievers. But now for the believers, it's not death to us anymore. It, it, like, it doesn't have that power over us, okay? It is. When there's a commandment, it's in our nature to break that commandment. So how do you overcome sin? Well, first you believe the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus to overcome sin once and for all. Then how you live, it's the same thing. It's the gospel. You set your mind on things above. You have to yeah. renew your mind every day on Jesus. That's yeah, so see, see, see how they're now when they do that, right? When he, what he's just doing, he's just taking out like verse, like verses from all over. Set your mind on things above. That's from one book. And then he's like, uh, what did he say? mind on things above you have to renew your mind every day on jesus yeah renew your mind renew your mind that's from romans 12 and then set your mind on things above that's from like philippians okay and so he's just like he's just taking and now they're like just basically cliches right and he's saying that that's how you can live as a christian but that's not telling us anything and that's not what the new testament tells us when the new testament tells us how to live as christians it tells us not to sin don't do this, don't do that. It's telling them. Again and again, he tells them. Paul does, Peter does, and John does. Don't sin. Don't do this, don't do that. Okay? Like I was saying, 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it literally says our sanctification is through not committing fornication. Okay? So whatever, like these guys just don't get it. They don't understand. Their sanctification for going to heaven, the sort of like the positional sanctification that, that some people will say. You're sanctified through Christ. You're holy and perfect for all time, and you're going to heaven. That's because of Christ's sacrifice. But now you have to learn how to live as a Christian. And it's not just by, oh, renewing your mind and set your mind on things above. That's just Those are just cliches. Okay? That doesn't tell you how to live. Set your mind on things above. How does that tell me what I should do in my daily life to live as a Christian? It doesn't. Okay? You don't set your mind on things. I mean, set your mind on things above so that you can love your neighbor, so that you can, whatever, avoid fornication and other things, man. That's where the fruit comes from. Ephesians chapter 4, starting verse 23, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which is Jesus, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Yeah, the new man is not Jesus, first of all. Putting on the new man is putting on the man that doesn't sin and lives a good and righteous life in, in Christ. Okay, He's telling them to live righteous and holy, to live that way. He's telling them to. Okay, he's not saying that they're going to go to hell if they don't. That's the important thing we know now as free gracers. But he's not saying that, oh, that all that stuff is just, oh, just, just think about Jesus all the time and you won't sin. No. Which after God has created in righteousness and true holiness, preach the gospel to yourself. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ died for my sins. He was buried and rose again on the third day. Even if you're struggling with sin... You come boldly to the holiest of holies by the blood of Jesus with confidence. That's faith. 
It's no longer you that lives, but Jesus that lives inside you. I have. You come boldly if you're if you're what I don't know, man. You come boldly to the according to the riches of His grace. I don't know, like see, he brings that come boldly to the throne of grace, like that thing. I don't think that's about that, okay? It's not about, oh, even if you sin, just come boldly. That's not what it's about. It's about something else. I don't even, I'm not going to look up that passage right now. But he's just taking stuff out of context and just saying stuff. This is what these guys do, these unlearned and unstable teachers, you know? Now, this guy, like, like I say, I like him because he's basically free grace, but they're just very confused and they don't get things. He should just shut up about this stuff and just talk about the gospel, free grace gospel, and that's it. That's what you know, sniffing Pharisees. That's what you know, okay? You know the gospel? Good. Preach that. Don't preach this stuff. You don't know this. You don't get this. You don't know what you're talking about, man. You're all over the Bible. You're taking out passages out of context. You don't know how to do this, okay? You have not studied the Bible for many years. You have not, like, done any kind of advanced study or anything, okay? You're just like a kid. You're just like a babe in Christ. I don't know how long you've been a Christian, but you don't get this, okay? You don't understand. So I would just stop. And like I say, man, if I'm wrong, prove it. But don't just say I'm wrong and, and, and do this stupid nonsense where you, with your decontextualized verses, okay? Don't do that. And also, I'll just advise you, man. Take those and and new IFB idiots off your page, man. You look like a punk like them. Those guys are straight heretics. They teach people that gay people can't be saved. Okay, if you if you support them, you're a heretic too. So I'm gonna have to then come after you. You know, I have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. I have been quickened. I have been seated in heavenly places. I am accepted in the beloved. I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who cares? What does that mean? That means that you don't have to like, like, like consciously stop yourself from not committing adultery or whatever. I don't understand. What are you talking about, man? How does any of this relate to this? This, this is how confused you guys are, and you think you're, you think you're making sense, right? Because that's what happens. That's what happens. Okay. Because you're just in the Bible, you're just reading, you're just thinking, and then it's like it gets all it gets all in your head, and then you think everybody else gets what you're talking about. What you're saying here makes no sense, okay? You're making no sense. All I have to do is set my mind on things above and renew my mind every day, and then that's how I live as a Christian. What does that mean? That doesn't mean anything. Why does Paul have so many letters and letters and letters? Telling us how to live like Christians, if all we have to do is set our mind on things above and renew our mind. I fellowship with the Father. I am sealed unto the day of redemption. Set your yeah. mind on Jesus. Yeah, you're sealed until the day of redemption. So you don't have to worry about your salvation. But what does it say? Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God by which you are sealed until the day of redemption. It says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. What do you think that means? It means don't sin. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. Okay? Did you even show that part? Yeah, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. What do you think that means? You think that means, oh, just renew your mind every day and just set your mind on things above and just don't worry about the law. No, he's saying don't sin. That's what, he, that's what that means, okay? Redemption. Set your mind on Jesus. He wants to have fellowship. The problem, the problem is it's us who hides from God in fear and condemnation, which is what the law produces. Adam and Eve hid from God. It wasn't God who hid from them. I don't fear, nor do I feel condemned, because I'm dead to the law. So what I'm going to do now is go over some verses that are taken out of context to suggest the law plays a role in our spiritual walk. The first verse that's taken out of context, Romans chapter 3, verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. What people do with this verse is that we establish the law, and by establish the law they mean follow the law. 
that's not what it means to establish the law. Because if we look at the context a few verses earlier in verse 19, Paul says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. You establish the law by giving it its purpose, to stop everyone's mouth, to let the law condemn, so they'll place their faith in Jesus. That's how you establish the law. Next verse that's taken out of context. Place of faith in Jesus. But then again, how do you? How are you supposed to live your life as a Christian? Can you explain that to me? Oh, set your mind on Christ. What does that mean? What does that mean? Does that mean I shouldn't commit adultery? Because that's the law. Like I don't know. Like these guys don't get it, man. Next. Hebrews chapter six verse one. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. What people do with this verse in Hebrews is that you get justified by faith in Jesus. Now forget about that. Go on to perfection by the law. That can't be because earlier in chapter 5 of Hebrews it says, And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. I am already perfect. Everyone else who trusts in Jesus alone is perfect. No, no, that says and that. Later that in says that, seven that is, says that Jesus is made perfect. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all of them that obey him. That's not saying that you were made perfect. Now it does say in, in Hebrews later that we were made that we were sanctified for all time by by Christ's perfect sacrifice. That's in Hebrews 10. But he's just not understanding these things. He's teaching them wrong. But I mean, this is not the biggest problem with this video, but it's not very good. Also trust in Jesus alone is perfect. And then later in chapter seven, it says, for the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. Going back to the law for spiritual growth is not going into perfection. That's actually going back into perdition, as it says in chapter 10, starting verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. Notice what it doesn't say. The just shall live by law. No, oh, because like he's talking about how they were like going back to do the animal sacrifices again, and he's saying that that is drawing back to, unto perdition. Okay. He's, again, this is about salvation and that stuff, right? It's not about saying like. Again, I just, I just, I just want to make this very clear. If you, if you don't sin, if you try to avoid sin, right, you are obeying the law, okay? Because sin is transgression of the law, all right. If you say I'm not going to commit adultery because Jesus wouldn't want me to. That's obeying the law because you know Jesus wouldn't want you to. There's tons of stuff like that. The law is perfect, good, and just. But if any man draw back, go back to the law, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So next verse. That's taken out of context. First John chapter five, starting verse two. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. What these heretics do is say you love God by keeping his, the commandments. Of, and by commandments, they mean the law of Moses, which is love God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. The only person who has loved God with their entire being is Jesus Christ. The commandments for us are found in the same book, 1 John. You can't take 1 John and then go to Matthew and say those are the commandments. No, no, that's not, like, I don't know, anyway. Okay, let's just accept what he's saying is true, all right? So he's These saying, are the commandments. First John three twenty three or something, it says, love god and love one another that's the commandment or believe or have faith in jesus believe in jesus and love one another that's the commandment okay first john chapter 3 verse 23 and this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son jesus christ and love one another as he gave his commandment yeah, love one another what does that mean 
What does love one another mean? I mean, I'm pretty sure it, a lot of it involves not breaking the law against each other, like not stealing from each other, not committing adultery with each other's wives and stuff. That's part of loving one another, right? Those are the commandments to love God. You believe on Jesus. And how do you know? How do we know how, what love one another means? It's put through the law. Yeah, don't steal their stuff. Okay, don't commit adultery with them. Don't envy their their wife or whatever. All that stuff, we know how to love from the law. I don't know these guys don't get it, man. They're very simplistic. They just think, oh. Well, we're dead to the law, so that means the law is just a piece of garbage. To throw it in the garbage. This is stupid. Like, I mean, like, I don't know. Like, like, like I said, this guy's all right. I like him, but I bet you anything. What he's gonna do if he either, if he sees this video, he's gonna just get his back up and start f trying to fight me over it. So then, this is why I'm saying he's just like those guys, like those uh, destroying the works of the devil and truth spellers. These guys are unlearned and unstable false teachers. I mean, those two are. Sniffing out Pharisees has not, I, I would say he, this is bad what he's doing, but he's not at the level of what I would call a false teacher at this point. But if he doesn't take this warning I'm giving him here with some maturity and change his ways, well, then that's what he is. He's a false teacher and a heretic. Okay, he's teaching that new IFB garbage pushing that garbage uh, and you love one another specifically the brethren next passage that's taken out of context matthew chapter 5 starting verse 17 think not that i am come to destroy the law of the prophets i am not come to destroy but to fulfill for verily i say unto you till heaven and earth pass one jaw or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law pass from the, law, from the law till all be fulfilled whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven but whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be great the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven what these false prophets do is they say jesus is telling you to follow the law <laughs> and if you do follow the law you'll be great in the kingdom of heaven if you don't follow the law, you'll be least in the kingdom of heaven. Well, if you read literally the next couple of verses, Jesus is speaking perfection. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. Have you been angry with your brother? No, no, you see how these, these guys are very simplistic again, like I say. Like, he just thinks he's got this figured out. The words of Jesus, which are very difficult to interpret, okay? Very. This passage... Matthew five seventeen to twenty. I I wrote a paper on this. This thing is this that that passage is very difficult to interpret. Okay, now what exactly does it mean? Uh it's tough to say. But this part seems to be about salvation, and the earlier part seems to be about discipleship. Because in the earlier part, he said that if you if you follow them, if you follow the laws. If you if you if you break the least of the commandments and teach men so you should be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But if you should do and teach them, the same will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So both of those people are going to heaven. Both of them are going to be in the kingdom of heaven. So then they're they're saved, right? So that seems to be about discipleship. But then when you go to when you go to this part, this seems to be about salvation, you know? So, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. That's like only if you get the righteousness of Christ, then you can exceed that. Yeah. Time thou shalt not kill you that whosoever is angry with the judgment, with judgment, empty headed. So I suppose the apostle Paul, nations, who hath bewitched. Oh uh, yeah. So now they're saying this. Whosoever so. shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Yeah, because this is the thing, like, this is the part, like, uh, obviously, 
nobody does this, right? Nobody, nobody lives a life where they never, they are never angry with their brother without a cause. Nobody can do that, right? Nobody can never say, call somebody a fool. Nobody has done that. We've all done that. So for that reason, we need Jesus. Otherwise, we're going to hell. Okay, that's what he's saying. But he, but when the earlier part, I think he was talking about save people because both of those groups, whether they obey the law or they don't, they're all going to heaven. So I suppose the apostle yeah. Paul is in danger of hellfire. Then, Galatians chapter three verse one. Oh foolish! Before whose eyes Jesus Christ? No one has done the law of Moses. That's the point. You. No one has done the law of Moses. That's the point. So who will be called great in heaven? Jesus. Who will be least in the kingdom of heaven? Believers. What you also have to understand. All believers will be least in the kingdom of heaven. Hmm. I don't think that's what he's talking about. How could like every every single believer is the least? And Jesus is the great. I don't think that's what that's talking about at all. Okay, but whatever. These guys just, again, it's this simplistic thing. They think they got it all figured out. <laughs> like, it's so hilarious. These guys have no clue. And is that Jesus taught a works-based salvation in the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Here's just one example. In Matthew chapter 19, starting verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. I guess according to Jesus, to go to heaven, I gotta keep the commandments. Theoretically, if you can keep all the commandments perfectly, then yes, you would earn heaven. Obviously, no one has done this, so you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 16, starting verse 30, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. See, this guy had the right attitude. He knew he was going to hell, so he asked what to do to be saved. This is, this is, he's correct here, this thing that he's saying here, but I don't know what, when he talks about how to live as a Christian, he doesn't get it. He thinks it's like, oh, you just set your mind on things above and renew your mind. What? Man in Matthew who asked Jesus what to do to have eternal life, Jesus responds with keep the commandments, all of them, perfectly, never sin. You have to be careful with the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and really every book in the Bible. You can teach heresy, even damnable heresy, if you're not careful. Yeah, you should be careful, son. Because you don't know what you're talking about, man. You are an unlearned and unstable teacher, okay? If you if you don't want to uh, court destruction, you should, as it says there, 2 Peter 3, 15 to 16. If you don't want to get that destruction on you, you should stop teaching like you know everything like you don't know what you're talking about man this is not a coincidence god made verses in the bible for the self-righteous to take out of context unto their own destruction as is as it says in second Peter. that's what you're doing right now eh you're being self-righteous by acting like oh i figured out free grace so all you works-based people and anybody who teaches that you have to follow the law after you're saved you're just a bunch of idiot, idiots and heretics. So you, you're the one who's being self-righteous right now, okay? You, you're acting like you got this whole Bible figured out, but you don't know, okay? You do not know, all right? I've shown in this video multiple times how you take verses out of context that you don't understand what you're talking about, okay? You want to talk about it some more? Comment me or whatever. Email me, you know? But yeah, you're you're just this is terrible. Terrible. Peter chapter three verse sixteen. As also in all his epistles. Yeah. Speaking. This is you, man. This is you. Okay? You wanna be like this? Unto their own destruction. That's you, bro. And you think it's not they're saved. Those people that Peter's talking about right there are saved. Okay? 
chapter 3, verse 16, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. <clears throat> unto their own destruction. You want to teach work salvation? Okay, there's plenty of verses for you to twist out of context. We're not teaching work salvation. We're saying how do we how do Christians live after they're saved? After they're saved by faith alone without any works, how are they supposed to live? Well, it seems pretty clear that what they're supposed to do is good works, which is good works of the law. Works of the law. Okay, good works. You do that and you can drop into the pits of hell. So that's basically all I have. I like to go over the main points again. Starting with no, point number sorry, one. Man. Anyway, I don't know how long that video was. I hope that wasn't too long, but that was ridiculous, man. I feel sorry for this guy. But this is what happens, man. This is what happens when you, when you start teaching the Bible. It goes right to your head, okay? And people that don't know how very complicated the Bible is think that they can figure it out by this proof texting garbage that this guy's doing and they don't know. And I just advise on any of my listeners not to follow this path. If you want to understand the Bible, you have to look very carefully. If you want to exegete some text from the Bible, you don't just read it and take it out of context and just that's what it means, what it says. You have to look at it carefully in the context Think about it deeply. Read what some other people think about it. You don't have to agree with them, but just read them and get some different opinions on it and see what everybody's thinking. Why do they think what they think? Look at it again. It's not easy. It takes time, all right? You can't just go around taking verses out of context and saying what you think it means and teaching people that, okay? So be careful sniffing out Pharisees. I do like you, man. I do, and I do appreciate some of the videos you put out there before that, that helped me to understand free grace a little bit better. But at this point, I would say I understand it better than you. And you're not teaching it right, okay? Because sal you got the gospel part right, the salvation part. But you don't understand this thing about the Christian life and discipleship. You don't get it. And you should stop teaching this nonsense, whatever you're teaching. It's a bunch of foolishness. Stop following those guys, David Benjamin and Greg Jackson. Those guys are weirdos. Stop following um, those new IFB guys. Those guys are weirdos. They're heretics. They literally teach that gay people can't get saved. You think? If, do you think that's true too? You're another heretic if that's true. If you think that's true, that so-called gay people can't get saved, then you're a heretic. I don't think you do think that. So take those and new IFB guys off your vi off your channel, man. I start just smarten up, man. Smarten up. All right. Thanks for watching Toronto Bible Study. Hallelujah.